This video is brought to you by Galaxy Lamps. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we are responding to a video from the channel The Food Theorist, which is of course one of the channels run by MatBat, so one of his popular channels. The uh, video in question is titled Food Theory You Would Hate the 700 year old meal medieval times and on the thumbnail we have the words medieval food sucks now of course this could be just clickbait maybe he doesn't actually mean it and on the video he will explain but considering the fact that in the past uh, almost every time that MatPat has addressed something medieval it was a problem that needed to be debunked uh, we're gonna have a look at this video together so let's watch it together maybe we'll debunk it maybe he gives good information let's see Greetings upon the internet! Welcome to Ye Olde Food Theory! The show that strives for the authentic medieval YouTube experience. Yeah, just in case you didn't know, YouTube used to have a five-star rating system instead of likes and dislikes. <laughs> really? I had no idea. But you know what is the best place for creating the ambiance and being in medieval times? Medieval times! The US-based theme restaurant that transports diners back in time to experience all the food, all the sights, and all the drama of feasting while at a medieval- I love that at the bottom right corner we've got a helmet that is actually not medieval, but it's more of a renaissance 16th century helmet, but it is what it is. I'm in a champions. Authenticity is a key selling feature for this chain. This is a debunking video by MatPat, the way I understand it. So he's going to debunk this medieval restaurant. It's interesting how if their selling point is medieval authenticity, already a very quick glance at the sort of costumes that they're wearing kind of debunks that already. So it's like, what the heck are they doing? And there isn't anything accurate about it. So um, I understand why he's making this video. So let's see how well he debunks them. Employees are instructed to almost never break character for any reason. Diners are outright served without silverware to replicate that medieval dining experience. So is medieval times actually the authentic medieval dining experience? Probably not. <laughs> also, I've got something to say about removing cutlery in the medieval period, but perhaps Perhaps MatPat is going to address that, so I'll give him space first. To begin, let's determine where and when the story of medieval times is meant to take place. The medieval ages, also known as the Middle Ages, are a period of history lasting roughly a thousand years, starting with the fall of Rome and lasting until the Italian Renaissance. Yeah, I like that he said roughly, because it's true that it sort of depends on what scholarly approach you take. Some people say they lasted a thousand years, some people say they lasted 500 years. It really depends how you count and what sort of nomenclature you choose. Personally, I tend to prefer to call it a 1000 years period so yes I agree with that but I appreciate that he said roughly. He claiming something is medieval is about as non-specific as you get. A thousand years is a long time in history. Back in 1983 Medieval Times' founder Jose Montaner converted his family-owned restaurant into a type of dinner theater where audiences could feast while watching his family's history which traced back to the 11th century. Oh very interesting so 11th century we're really in the high medieval period. Also the original idea sounds quite fun I'd love to visit a restaurant like that. And indeed it's there in 11th 11th century Spain that the original medieval times stories were set. It's possible that they might have migrated forward in time a bit. As such, I'm gonna give them a bunch of wiggle room. Let's say between the years 950 and 1250. This means even if we're assuming the latest possible date here, medieval times still should be happening about 200 years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It's hard to overstate just how much of a cultural influence the Columbian exchange had on the world at large, as boats and people constantly sailed back and forth across the Atlantic. This meant things like the introduction of brand new ingredients to European and chefs. Things like sugar, chocolate, vanilla, all of that came into play in a brand new way and forever changed the way that recipes were designed. Okay, here's the thing. Um, it's true that quite a lot of like new plants and new vegetables and fruits were imported from uh, the new world to the old world and absolutely that did influence uh, the way Europeans cooked and created recipes. I mean, even staple foods such as Italian food with a lot of tomatoes all over the place. Tomatoes obviously come from America, which means that for the majority of the medieval period, people didn't have access to tomatoes, but sugar as he says is not one of these new ingredients sugar was already present of course not in abundance but it was not a new ingredient like he's making it sound to be for european people and chefs it wouldn't have been available to the commoners but it was absolutely known it is a well-known fact that crusaders brought back sugar from the crusades also in 1099 we have the first recorded mention of sugar in england but even earlier than that both the romans and the greeks knew about sugar, spoke about it, and had access to it. The Greeks describing it as having a similar consistency to salt, and the Romans describing both the Indian and the Arabic one, where Pliny the Elder already in the first century tells us that India's sugar was better, and he says that it was found in cane, white as gum, that crunches between the teeth. So the notion the sugar was not known in Europe and was only introduced during the Colombian exchange is incorrect. 
All right, so a lot of other things to explore, and we'll do that after a brief word from our sponsor. So, it's the beginning of April and it's Easter sale. What better time to spruce up your place with a projector from Galaxy Lamps. A cool way to create a great atmosphere and brighten up your party. They are really easy to use as they can be controlled through an app allowing you to choose your color combinations, sequences, rotation, and much more. Plus, they can be connected to Alexa and Google Assistant. Because it's Easter, you don't just get one deal, you get three. 50% off plus an extra 20% and 10 lucky winners will be randomly selected and will get a new projector worth almost $200 for free. Click the link in the description, but do it now, as this offer ends on the 10th of April. A big thanks to Galaxy Lamps for sponsoring my video. But even existing ingredients would transform as a result of all this. So just right off the bat, living in the post-Columbian exchange world is going to make our food inauthentic tasting. The food that exists today, it's just going to taste better 9 times out of 10 because our ingredients have the benefit of selective breeding and engineering. Also f Okay, I actually disagree with this. I don't think that our food necessarily tastes better. Also because remember that our foods in our day and age unless you eat at a farm or are blessed by your mum's cooking, uh, most of the times are filled and packed with sugars, with chemicals, with sodium, which doesn't always necessarily translate to tasting better. Stuff in the medieval period would have been a lot fresher, and only food that was in season would have been eaten. Another interesting fun fact is that a lot of the foods that we consider to be kind of high class, like, oh, I'm going to eat salmon, it was actually food that even the poor could eat. Whereas chicken, which is something that everyone can eat, was something reserved more for someone who had money and power. The fact that he mentioned selective breeding as a way to make the food taste better is not always the case. Oftentimes we change things just because of the looks, for example, white bread. Not only to make white bread, we remove a lot of the stuff that is actually good for you. A lot of the food we have is overly engineered and overly refined. With that being said, it's true that some of the foods that originally in the medieval period, some vegetables, some roots, looked purple and then turned into another color, well, oftentimes the losing of that specific pigment helped removing some bitterness from the fruit. So yeah, sometimes it's true, but it's not always. Modern food tastes better than medieval food. Not necessarily. Also falling into the tastes inauthentic category are the drinks. But alas, nobody in medieval Europe was drinking anything close to what we'd call a soda. Instead, many of the nobility would have been drinking wine and ale. So let's just start off the wine, shall we? Modern wine is a triumph of venting and science that would be utterly baffling to even the most masterful winemaker back in the Middle Ages. Yeast, the magic little fungi that digivolves boring old grape juice into palatable alcoholic wine, wasn't discovered as an individual organism until 1680. Before then, people had no idea what mechanism actually created the alcoholic flavor and effect. As a result, they would just take rotten grape juice and throw random stuff into it until it tasted okay. Winemaking was just a complete gamble here. They were trying anything from other fruit juices to herbs and spices to even powdered marble trying to make it taste palatable. You know, enjoy drinking your fermented grape sludge. Okay, I think this is the one point that I disagree the most with, respectively, of course. He's mostly talking about wine, but I think the point he's trying to draw is the fact that because medieval people weren't as advanced, scientifically speaking, as us and didn't have the same level of understanding of, for example, the chemistry involved, the molecules involved with the production and what happens basically with wine, then they, what they were making was, was horrible, uh, which is basically how he's putting it, because they didn't understand the science. And so basically it was a gamble, they didn't know what they were doing, it was all random. Simply because someone doesn't understand the science behind something, uh, any process, it can be applied to wine, the molecules and the chemical processes, but even to cooking up to a certain extent, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to achieve great things just through experiential knowledge. This thing that he's saying, they just tried things until something worked, well that is not a small thing. To drive this point home, imagine someone who cooks at home and they do an exceptional job, they're really good, but do they have to be food scientists to pull that off? Can you be a great cook even if you don't understand everything at a molecular level and all the chemistry and science involved with the processes that you activate out of your own experience? Absolutely yes. In fact, if you think about it, even though medieval people didn't understand the science of metallurgy the same way we do, they still were able to build full suits of plate armor in steel, oftentimes between low to medium carbon steel, sometimes even high carbon, through the process of experimenting. 
and still for a different, but still quite applicable example. Whoever MatPat's editor is, do they understand everything when it comes to the process of the coding, all the way down to the transistors and everything that happens inside a computer when they edit a video? Probably not. The majority of editors out there do not understand computers at a fundamental level in the sense that they know that if they click there and they click this and they move this and they drag that, they're gonna have a great video. So even if they don't know exactly what's happening at the level of the code and even behind the transistors and everything at a microscopic level that happens inside your computer and the chips and the motherboard, they are still able to produce a pretty good result. So this notion or idea that just because medieval people didn't understand everything at a scientific level, at a molecular level, then that equals that they weren't able to cook well or produce good wine or produce good beer, it, it doesn't hold water. We'll start off with the very first course for all attendees, tomato bisque. Tomatoes are delicious and are considered to be a staple of modern European foods, especially Italian food. But before the Colombian exchange, tomatoes weren't available in Europe at all. When Europeans first saw tomato leaves, they recognized them as being related to nightshade, a poisonous plant. That then made Europeans skeptical of eating tomatoes for a long time, meaning that even after the Colombian exchange- Okay, just a little thing about this. This is just a little nitpick and I'm mostly saying it not necessarily to criticize him but just to bring in an interesting piece of information but you know how he has this little medieval although again he's wearing a post medieval suit of armor but still um, that guy is looking down at the tomatoes as if they're being presented to him from America uh, and then he sees them and he's like oh what the heck is that but I think it would have been a much better touch if instead of using modern tomatoes which are large and red which is not how American tomatoes in the Middle Ages would have looked if he had used small and yellow ones which is most likely the variety that was imported and introduced from America to Europe at this time, which is probably one of the reasons why even today the Italian word for tomato is pomodoro. Pomo being a kind of archaic word to say apple and doro meaning of gold, so apple of gold, which makes sense if considering the fact the original tomatoes were yellow. And this association in the mind of medieval people between apples and stuff that is coming from America is not only found in this Italian word pomodoro, but also in the French word for potatoes, which is pomme de terre, so apples of the ground. Fascinating. It still took an additional 200 years for tomatoes to actually catch on as a food. That makes the bowl of tomato bisque that starts your medieval times meal about as historically accurate as giving a knight a musket. The next course is probably- Another very small nitpick, but when he says that this tomato bisque is as accurate as giving a knight a musket, Believe it or not, muskets were present in the time of knights. But this is a nitpick because the way he's using musket is probably the modern way. So he's talking about the sort of early firearms used during, I want to say, Napoleonic Wars. But actually, specifically in the time of knights, when there were still knights in full plate armor, uh, not only firearms were available, and I think a lot of people think that firearms are an early modern invention, whereas it's not. Hand pistols were already used even in the early 15th century. But the reason why you might want to be careful when you say muskets and knights cannot coexist is because the actual usage of the word musket in its earliest usage just means a very large aquebus that was so heavy that needed to be placed on top of a support. If you give that in the hands of a knight, it actually wouldn't be as bad as giving people bisque. Probably the most historically accurate, the salad. Everyone from the lowliest peasants to the richest noble would certainly have eaten their fair share of salads back in the Middle Ages, because meat was just expensive and difficult to produce. As a result, meat was reserved mostly for special occasions unless you were very well off. And even then, the powerful Catholic Church banned eating meat or even animal products on Fridays, Saturdays, and Wednesdays. That's right, in the Middle Ages, even the most powerful of noble was vegan three times a week. So well, unless they ignored it, which sometimes they do. I mean, there are a lot of things the medieval popes and the medieval church said they banned crossbows, they banned jousting tournaments and people just ignore them, particularly the powerful. So there is that. So a salad isn't out of place here at all. Might as well give medieval times a point for this one, because it is honestly the only point they're getting this episode. Moving on to the main course, we've got ourselves a few options. A half chicken, some barbecue pork ribs, kielbasa sausage, and a vegetarian hummus plate. So let's just go down the line, shall we? The half roasted chicken is probably the most realistic option of the bunch. Chickens first arrived in Europe via trade around 800 BC. So it's perfectly reasonable to think that Europeans were cooking and eating chicken 
chickens in the 11th century. And because they were relatively easy to raise and slaughter, they presented a viable food option. That said, chickens weren't as common as beef or pork because they required more care and attention than your typical pig or cow. As a result, yeah, and also one thing that I'd like to add to this is, is not wrong, but one thing I'd like to add is that it's not that like people could just eat chicken. He did mention earlier on the video that it's, um, you know, usually it's people that have certain amount of wealth that can eat or have access to meat. Well, it kind of depends on what meat we're talking about, but specifically chicken, it's not that they're necessarily easier to raise and that's the reason why only the powerful could kill chicken but it's mostly because birds that can lay eggs are a food source and an asset so only someone who is wealthy can kill a bird that would have otherwise produced eggs whereas if you were a farmer you would avoid poultry and mostly because you want to keep the birds so they keep uh, laying eggs and you maintain the asset as a result chickens were often reserved for special occasions like feasts or holidays pigs also viable on the tasting menu they were domesticated thousands of years ago so it's not unreasonable to think that our medieval feast would have had some pork ribs sure their barbecue sauce wouldn't have been loaded with sugar and tomato paste like modern barbecue sauces but they would season their meats with spices and wine so pretty darn close and also medieval people seasoned I'd like to underline that medieval cuisine varies enormously between places so for example uh, in Italy you would have had a, a more usage of olive oil whereas if you go further up north then butter is usually the sort of fat that is used for cooking so very much depends on what's available locally obviously because things weren't as connected as they are today but medieval people include including farmers and peasants absolutely knew how to make sauces from herbs and lots of different ingredients and vegetable sauces to garnish their food. So thinking that medieval food was horrible if you were poor is not necessarily true. It's just that as a poor person you might not be able to afford the same to eat the same kind of stuff that rich people did, which means that also there was a sort of a discrepancy when it comes to nutrition, but in reality, we still have that today. As recently as 400 years ago, potatoes were still a complete mystery to Europeans. You know what else was a mystery to them? Corn, another staple food item that was introduced to Europe as part of the Colombian exchange. Jeez, when you look at the food roster here, it seems like all the most delicious stuff was over in the... Uh, once again, though, corn wouldn't have looked like that. So it would have been, I think, interesting to uh, also show the colors vegetables and fruit had in the Middle Ages. There was a lot more purple. If that's something you might be interested in, let me know and I might make a video or a short about it. All right, but I hope that you enjoyed this video. Hello to Matt Pat, and if you did enjoy it, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not a member of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to check out the link in the description below to take advantage of the amazing offer by Galaxy Lamps. Thank you very much for watching and remember the Metatron. I spread his wings. Goodbye.